Welcome, everybody. My name is Jen Chambers. I am the Assistant Vice President of Lifelong Learning here in Alumni Engagement and Development. This evening, we have one of our Forever Learning Institute sessions. Uh, one of the things we frequently ask alums is, what would you like to learn more about? And one of the topics we often get is current events. And if you've been watching the news recently, I am sure you have noticed some of the recent uh, news attention around the topic of banning books. So uh, last week was actually the American Library Association's Week of Banned Books, where they look at banning books and the practice of banning books happening across the United States. Some interesting stats to share with you around banning books. Um, in 2018, there were 347 books that were formally challenged um, by libraries and schools across the nation. And uh, in 2021, that number was nearly uh, quadrupled at uh, 1,597. So we're seeing an increase in banning books across the United States. Um, there are certain types of books that have been banning, but as we will learn um, this evening in our first session, looking at books published prior to the printing press, banning books is not a new thing. This has been going on around the world for many, many years. And, um, and basically they started as soon as books were printed and distributed. So uh, what we have up for this evening is three fantastic faculty members from uh, the Trinity School and uh, the Graduate School. And, uh, and hosting this evening's session with me is my um, wonderful friend and amazing volunteer, Vikash Patel. Vikash is the uh, class of 1996 bio and religion uh, graduate. He also graduated from the School of Medicine in 2000 and he did his residency at Duke in dermatology. He is a practicing physician. He has his own practice over in Raleigh, and he lives with his family in Cary. In addition to being an awesome volunteer in general, Vakash is also the new president of the Duke Alumni Board and will be hosting this evening's session with me. So with that, I will turn it over to Vakash, who will introduce our speakers this evening. Thank you, Jen, for the warm introduction. Um, and thank you, all of you, for joining our program called Before the Printing Press. So part of our Forever Learning Institute theme Policing Pages, A History of Banned Books um, is what we're gonna be talking about tonight. Um, and then joining us joining us tonight from Trinity College of Arts and Sciences to share their insights and scholarly expertise are Lauren Ginsberg, um, Associate Professor of Classical Studies, joined by Director of Academic Engagement, Joe Supernow. And then we have two live uh, guests followed um, by Claire Woods, Associate Professor of Classical Studies. And then we'll have some quick follow-up questions from you. Um, the audience, and then we will move on to um, Martin Eisner, who's professor of Romance Studies, with uh, quick follow-up questions from you as well. So to get things started, we're going to contextualize our conversation, and we will first hear uh, from Lauren Ginsberg. Hey, everybody. I'm very glad to be here today and talking to Duke alumni about banned books coming from ancient Rome. Um, I'm a professor of classical studies, and we're going to talk about works of history today. So for ancient Romans, books were a really long symbol of freedom of speech. While someone could be prosecuted for all sorts of different actions, some serious and not, books were supposed to be able to be written and read by anyone. And a good example of this is that even the Roman dictator Julius Caesar, famous military man, had to accept that the poet Catullus wrote insulting, often sexual poems in a poetry book about him that would circulate freely, because that's the way things are supposed to be in a free society. Books and authors are supposed to be protected by this core concept of freedom, just like today. But this changes all of a sudden when Rome became an empire and entrusted the ruling of the state to one single actor. And this new form of government, empire, was headed at first by a man called Augustus, and then by his stepson Tiberius, and then by various heirs after them. And as it turns out, these men had very strong thoughts about books and about history books in particular. But to back up for a second, Rome was a culture that was obsessed with writing down its own history. In particular, it was obsessed with writing books that would celebrate so-called great men, who would then serve as examples, both moral and political examples, to generations of baby Romans to come. And so history books were seen as, as teaching Romans who they should be and how they should behave. History books could and did disagree on who was great, for example, why they were great, what lesson you should learn from different people in Rome's past. And it was then up to the reader was the understanding to sort of wrestle with themselves about the lessons they were supposed to take from these books. But all of a sudden, when Rome was ruled by one person, history books re received a sort of politicization that they'd never received before. 
And so what does that mean? All of a sudden, the state cared very, very much who was called great, which Romans were remembered, how deeds were recorded, and the influence that a work of history might have over a population who'd given up some of their freedom in order to accept empire. So in other words, the state now had a vested interest in how history would be told and preserved. And more concretely, all of a sudden, an author could be found guilty of treason, not for anything that he did, but because of a book that he wrote. So during the early years of the Roman Empire, we see an increase on the one hand of state-sanctioned book banning and also book burning, and on the other, state-sanctioned state executions of the authors of those books on the grounds of treason. So this is the highest crime possible. You could be executed for writing a book. And this phenomenon was incredibly short-lived. It blazed up very quickly under the first couple of Roman emperors, Augustus and his heir Tiberius, but it seems to have fizzled out after about a century of empire because as empire continued, autocrats no longer really felt so insecure. So they felt like they could allow certain freedoms of expression to return. But during the early empire, authors and their books were exposed to a new kind of violent censorship, which the state claimed it was doing to protect its citizens against dangerous ideas. So let's put some people into the story because people make everything better. I'm gonna focus on a few select individuals and their banned books. And as I tell you their stories, I want to note the crimes for which they're accused, the ways in which their books were banned, and also the significant inefficiency of those bans. Because as it turns out, banning books is actually hard, even then. So then I'm going to close by introducing some of the people who fought hardest against these banned books and what we can learn from them today. So the first man is a man named Primutius Cordus, who is living under the emperor Tiberius in the first century CE. Cordus wrote what was, by all accounts, a fantastic, vivid, engaging, gripping work of history about the end of the Republic, which included the assassination of Julius Caesar and the wars that were waged by his assassins, Brutus and Cassius. But Cordus did apparently too good a job of praising the assassins of Julius Caesar, Cassius and Brutus, and he seems to have called them heroes of a fallen government whose death marked the end of democracy. And so as a later historian records, Cordus was charged with what was until then an entirely unheard of charge, namely that he'd published a work of history. Cordus accepts that he's gonna be executed, but he gives an impassioned speech on what it is to write history, how history books have always been a space where free speech and debates should flourish, and the importance of books to the freedom of estate citizens. And he also notes that the fact that he's being punished for words and not for deeds would actually leave a mark against the state, not against him or about anything that he wrote. So Cordus goes to his death and we're told the Senate orders this massive public book burning as a spectacle to the harm that history books can do. And yet we're also told that individuals hid copies of his books. They circulated them secretly and they kept them alive to be read by later generations. And as a later Roman writer notes in his own history book, quote, this fact should lead us to laugh at the idiocy of those who believe that an act of autocracy today can extinguish the memory of a book later. On the contrary, a literary genius becomes more authoritative once it has been banned, end quote. So let's flash forward about 80 years under an emperor named Domitian. Two other historical writers named Aurelianus Rusticus and Herennius Senecio were executed on the same charge. They'd published biographies about famous philosophers named Thrasea Paetus and Helvidius Priscus, respectively. Each of these philosophers, in turn, was remembered as one who challenged the authority of an earlier emperor decades before. But these writers, by preserving the memory of dissidents, were convicted of treason for their own books. It was decreed at a trial that the writers, Rusticus and Senecio, had to die and also that their books had to be banned and publicly burned. So once again, we have a later Roman writer lament in his own book this new form of treason and also laugh at its ineffectuality. So I'm going to give you another quotation. These authoritarians thought, perhaps, that fire could destroy the voice of the Roman people, their freedom, the conscience of the human race. Certainly, we showed how patient we are. We would have lost our memory as well as our voice if it was as easy to forget forever as it is to keep silent in the moment, end quote. So Cremutius Cordus, Aurelianus Rusticus, and Herennius Senecio 
are only a few examples of authors who discovered that in essence, books you wrote could be tried for treason in the early Roman Empire. Not only were the authors themselves sentenced to die, but their books were sentenced to die. They were sentenced to round up by the state, be burned publicly as a warning to others, both authors of other books and readers about the danger of reading politically engaged books of history. But as later Romans continue to note, people didn't stop reading these books because books, as it turns out, are actually kind of hard to burn. You can burn one copy, great, or if you're as powerful as the Roman Senate, you can find as many copies as you can, and you can burn them in the greatest bonfire that the Roman world can imagine. And yet books are still a portable, movable, copyable technology. As soon as a book is out in the world, people begin to pass copies between themselves. Books are also a patient technology. They can thrive in secret, they can be stored in some musty closet, even while banned. So books in ancient Rome routinely outlived the bans against them. That seems to be a pattern that we see. They found a way to proliferate, to get into the hands of those that the state would deny access to them. And we found out that banned books survive, even when their authors don't. But I want to talk about how precisely these banned books survived. There's another chapter to the story, in other words, that people don't often talk about. So after the authors were dead, their treasonous books had been rounded up and burned. The flames took whatever copy the state could find. How could a book survive? Well, in all three of the examples that I just introduced you to today, the answer is the same. By the actions of a woman who ignored very real danger to ensure that books that she loved would live on. So the daughter of Cremutius Cordus was named Marcia, and it turns out that she was largely responsible for preserving and later republishing her father's banned books. Thanks to her, a later Roman author notes in his own book, and I quote, the state would have sustained a great loss if you, Marcia, hadn't rescued his works from oblivion. His banned books are now read, are popular, are received into men's hands and hearts, I like that phrase, and they fear no old age. But as for those who butchered the books and their author, before long men will cease to even remember who they were, aside from this great crime that they did, end quote. And so Marsh was remembered as a freedom fighter, someone who, in an act of daughterly devotion, preserved her father's banned books and also preserved for history the memory of him as a persecuted author. When the books of Senecio and Rusticus suffered the same sort of ban and public burning, a woman named Fania came to the rescue. She was intimately connected not to the authors of these banned books, but to the subjects of the biographies that they'd written. So she was the daughter of one of the dissident philosophers and the wife of the other. And at the trial of the authors, Senecio and Rusticus, she refused to deny her involvement in the writing of these books. She testified before the Roman Senate that she had provided the private journals of her father and her husband to these biographers to make sure that the biographies would be accurate. And so for this accessory to treason crime, she was sent into exile. But according to a contemporary source that lived at the same time she did, she brought into exile, and I quote again, those books which the Senate had ordered banned through compulsion and fear. These were the only possessions she managed to save when the rest of her goods were confiscated by the state, end quote. And so Fania outlived this emperor. She outlived his Senate. She outlived the ban on the books which commemorated people that she loved. And she played a key role in restoring these books to circulation when she herself was restored to Rome. It's like the books got to come out of exile too. So what are we learning from these stories of book banning in early imperial Rome? Well, first we learn that banning books through mass burnings is a fundamentally ineffective way to curb their circulation. Indeed, many ancient Romans comment that banning a book is a way to ensure its longevity. The technologies of book production, the proliferation of popular books, the hold they have on the popular imagination, and their ability to move and circulate makes them really hard to eliminate. Second, we learn that banned books outlive their bans routinely, and in the long view, actually serve as indictments of the state that did the banning. So autocrats at any generation might seek to control the history books that are being shared with their citizens. They may seek to twist historical truths to their own benefit. And they may treat as crimes books that oppose their fundamentalist vision. But in the end, a history book once written has a life of its own. And that's something that's hard to snuff out. And then third and finally, we can see that even in a patriarchal system like Rome, 
where the state is run by men, the emperor is a man, the authors who write important books are men, the people they write about tend to be men, women play a key role in thwarting the banning of books. They risk their lives to do this. They become conduits of knowledge, preservers of knowledge, and republishers of books that the state once deemed too dangerous to read. So the men who wrote these books die. The men who executed them eventually also pass on, but women are working behind the scenes to ensure that a banned book is never entirely gone. So those looking to ban books today should probably take note of these lessons. While people may seem quiet in the face of book banning in the moment, behind the scenes we have teachers, we have librarians especially, that are working to harness new technologies of book production to share these books with hungry audiences. And even as these individuals might be prosecuted by state actors, and we've seen that recently happening in connection with our country's public schools, others are going to rise up and are going to do this work. Because in the end, the Romans came to understand that banning books, above all, actually ensures that those books will be read today and in the future. Just because a ruling power might take issue with how history is being told in a given book doesn't mean that the book isn't speaking a powerful truth that's going to outlast any ban against it. So even in a world like ancient Rome, where writing a book could be treasonous, banned books kept finding a way to survive. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. So I'm really just blown away by the rich amount of history that goes into this thing that we even take for granted here in the United States, our, our freedom and access to books. And I think something that... Um, that really stood out to me was the importance of books to freedom. And so I'm wondering if you can maybe speak a little more to that piece of it, because, you know, that's something that we just inherently accept as truth in our world, but that's not necessarily the case. Yeah. So the Romans don't have a constitution that lays out freedom of speech but they do have a concept of freedom of speech, and it's often used this word libertas, which is just a Latin word that means freedom, and it can mean all sorts of things. But under the empire, the early empire especially, it comes to specifically be connected with freedom of dissident expression, and that can see that can occur in all sorts of genres of literature. So works of history is what I was talking about today, but we also talk about, or Romans talk about freedom of speech when it comes to political trials, so what a lawyer is allowed to say. Um, when it comes to works of tragedy, so what are play scripts allowed to say under an empire? And while in the past, I think Romans themselves also took for granted that books were just places in which free speech should flourish. It's why I include Julius Caesar and Catullus. I mean, Catullus is writing ridiculously silly poems that make fun of everything about Julius Caesar, including his bald spot. And Julius Caesar just accepts it because that's the way life is. Like people are going to read that book and it's fine because he has enough confidence to know it's still going to be fine for him. But somehow under the early empire, Romans start noticing that all of those things have changed and that things that you write now suddenly have become crimes against the state, whereas in the past, treason was considered actions, actions that you did against the state. And so it's something they start to pay attention to. And once the book bans kind of go down, once empire is more established, you see later authors reflecting back on this period and about the danger that it was. So even just being a writer seemed like it could be a politically charged act, no matter what you were writing about. Yeah. So do you think that it would have been better for the emperors to have just ignored the books and their authors if they really wanted the words forgotten? Because it seems like they did actually bring more attention to the things they wanted to squish yeah. out. I think probably yes, actually. I think, um, well, I think ignoring is always better than executing someone at that point in the books. But yeah, even the banning of the books and the burning, they saw time and time again that it was it was inefficient and that these were not, um, it was not actually possible to ban books. I mean, someone I didn't talk about because he's a little bit more famous is Ovid, um, who wrote a famous book called The Art of Love that went against the political morality of the day. And so he wasn't executed, he was exiled. But Intermediate Latin students read that book today and are able to ask why, why is it such a bad book? It's just kind of silly at this point. So I think we have lots of examples of other emperors, especially later emperors, not choosing not to care that much when people spoke things against them. And it's usually seen as a, a point of goodness for that emperor, even bad emperors who accept that people will say and write things against them. 
that's put in their good, their good books, that that's good. So I think, yes, like if they had actually wanted these works to go away, ignoring them would have been a more effective strategy. Yeah. And today we have so many other ways to share information that uh, there was a point you made early on that stood out to me and it was the portability and patience of books. Yeah. And knowing too, that even thinking about before our printing press, before we had electronic means to share things, you know, people were making these works of art by hand and still yet, you know, they were finding their ways in multiple copies across many generations. It's just yeah. incredibly poignant to think about how we can't really kill off something that's an idea or, you know, a writing. Yeah, an interesting aspect of Roman book writing, because yes, at this time, I mean, the technology of book production meant that books were slightly more of a luxury object. But we do have all over the Roman Empire scribes who would be copying books or portions of books but we also know a main way that people got to know literature was by hearing um, what we would call book readings. Like when an author would just read a chapter of their book, that was actually the primary way that people got access to new literature was actually by hearing it. And one of the articles that I read when thinking about this talk today was pointing out that you can't make someone forget what they heard. They may not even have the physical book anymore, but they can write down a description of what they heard, or they can talk about it with someone else and share that knowledge. And so even that way, you can't actually control what people are going to say about a book, even if you prevent them from getting physical access to it in their hands. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you can't take away something that you've learned. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about the women that you shared, the women who seem to have really played a prominent role in this conversation and banning books, even in ancient times. Let's, yeah. let's dive, dive into that some. Yeah, it's interesting because um, depending on, so a lot of ancient authors talk about book banning and talk about it in these negative ways, but not all of them mention the people who helped the books survive. It's actually the major people that talk about book banning don't mention these women at all. So it's almost anecdotal evidence that we find out that uh, Cremutius Cordis's daughter was involved in preserving his books, and then we find out about Fania preserving other books. Otherwise, they would be lost to history, their name and the things that they did. And it's interesting because women could be um, found guilty of things. Fania was exiled. That's a really major punishment. You're being stripped of your citizen rights and sent abroad. Uh, but women were also considered slightly sub-actors in that it's hard to convict a woman of treason at this point. Not impossible, but hard. And so women have this social power in that they move in the same circles as powerful men. They are able to move in different places. They have um, some financial freedom, and so they can have their own libraries and books. And so they can do things that male political actors can't because they're moving sort of in a, a shadow culture. Um, I don't want to say behind the scenes because obviously they're being recorded doing this, but they're able to have a freedom of movement and a freedom of expression that is considered a little bit less politically dangerous than men. And so they're able to use it to, for dissident acts that we see. And I think it would be hard. It would have been hard for a son of Crumucius Cordes to do this. I think he probably also would have been executed for treason. It would have been hard of a son. Um, or a husband of a philosopher to be able to get away with this. But women were able to survive. But I also don't want to minimize the actual real risk that they took. I mean, Fania, all of her possessions are being confiscated by the state. And the things that she chooses to hide and take with her are these books because they matter to her. So I think we also see women feeling like this is also their contribution to the writing of history. They're not getting uh, publishing deals in order to write their history books but without them, these words would have been lost to Roman history and the men celebrated in these books probably would have been lost as well. So I thought that was a, an interesting social historical aspect of this is we don't want to focus just on the authors of the banned books, but like who's actually fighting against the concept of book bans? And often it's women. One last question for you. Sure. What is something that you want our audience to take away as the lesson from your talk today and maybe how we apply that lesson to our current day uh, concerns around book bans? Yeah, I think that the lesson that I would want people to take away is that book bans usually only indict the state that is doing the banning in the long view of history. That uh, book bans, we've discussed how they're an inefficient way of actually removing a book from circulation. But more than that, book bans turn authors into celebrities. But more importantly, they make the state that's doing the banning look terrible because it's a suppression of free speech. And we see that come again and again. And we see later Roman authors laugh at the idea 
that a book ban could do anything but make you look like a terrible politician. And I think that's something that we should remember. I think book bans are always reactionary as they were in ancient Rome. I think they didn't tend to take a long view of history. They tended to have an unrealistic understanding of um, the interaction between states and, and published books. Um, but I think in the end, the fact that they just reveal that something is fundamentally wrong with a political culture that's trying to ban a book is something that we should really consider quite strongly. Thank you, Lauren, so much for sharing your wonderful wisdom with us today and a little lesson in history that I think Thank all of you. us will benefit from. Um, we really appreciate you being here and um, we're going to pass it off to our next speaker. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, you know, or Lauren, Lauren Ginsburg discussed banning books in Roman times and how the population reacted to this. Um, a, a takeaway that I got was how much it indicted the state itself that was doing the, the banning. We are now going to follow up with Claire Woods, Associate Professor of Classical Studies, with a quick, um, and we after this session, we'll have a couple of questions before we move on to our third speaker, and then we'll actually open it up for several minutes of questions to all of our panelists here. So I'm going to allow Dr. Woods to take it away here. Thanks, everyone. And I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Thank you to the Forever Learning Institute for inviting me to speak to you this evening. And thanks also to my colleague, Lauren, for such an interesting talk to start us off. When I was asked to participate in this Ban Books Before the Printing Press panel, as a, med as a medievalist, two particular examples immediately sprang to mind, one from the 9th century and the other from the 12th. In talking to you about these, I hope to illustrate some of the changes that occurred in the post-Roman world from the kinds of examples Lauren described in her talk. First of all, the crime that would get your book banned in the Middle Ages was more likely to be heresy than treason. This already gives a clue as to the chief authority concerned with policing texts and ideas in the medieval world, the church. For the period I'm talking about in Western Europe, this would be the Catholic Church, but not quite as we know it today. In the earlier medieval period, popes were less globally influential than in later centuries. In the ninth century, for example, regional networks of ecclesiastics, abbots, and especially bishops and archbishops would have been more involved in deciding whether or not texts were heretical and in pronouncing judgment on them. This is still largely the case by the time of my 12th century example, which takes place in France, although this time the Pope was ultimately involved in deciding the case. Let's turn then to my examples. We're going to follow the fates of two scholars whose careers, though in some ways very different, contain striking parallels, and not just because they were both tried and convicted of heresy. Our first scholar is Gottschalk, and I don't actually have an image of him, but I want you to imagine he's perhaps this disgruntled looking person here. Gottschalk was born to an aristocratic family around 803, and uh, he's sometimes referred to as of or bay, and I'm just going to move this along here so you can see some of the places that I'm talking about um, from the monastery that's just southwest of Reims, where he spent some time as a young man. But Gottschalk began his career at a different monastery, that of Fulda, on the eastern fringe of the then Frankish Empire. He is what's known as an oblate, a child offered to a monastery by his family to live out his life there as a monk. Gottschalk was probably around 10 years old when he was given to Fulda. There, he clearly excelled as a student in the monastery school, a school that under the direction of Rabanus Maurus, and I'm going to give you a quick look at Rabanus uh, before flipping back to this map. Um, under the direction of Rabanus Maurus, uh, was fast becoming one of the best schools in the Carolingian world. Gottschalk has been described as one of Rabanus's most gifted students, possibly his favourite student. One scholar has said that. His talent and promise is likely reflected in the fact that he was selected to study abroad at the monastery of Reichenau, which is all the way down here. Maybe the loveliness of that setting sparked his rebellion, or perhaps the death of his older brother, which might have given Gottschalk secular ambitions. But in 829, on his return from Reichenau to Fulda, Gottschalk decided that he wanted out of the whole monastic thing. He wanted to leave Fulda. He claimed that his profession as a monk had been coerced years earlier by Rabanus, who was now abbot of Fulda. The matter blew up such that it became the subject of a synod in Mainz, here we are in Mainz, in June of 829. Rabanus argued strongly that Gottschalk could not be released from his vows. 
the Synod decided otherwise. And it's worth noting that Gottschalk did have some supporters among the monks at Fulda. Gottschalk was released, though he was not permitted to claim back the inheritance his parents had also given to Fulda when they'd handed him over as a child. I mention all this because it sets the stage for Gottschalk's later troubles. Rabanus never forgave him. Gottschalk spent some years at the monasteries of Corby, um, that's up here, um, and Orbe, and then after receiving ordination as a priest, he moved on again, this time to northern Italy, he was down here, and then the Dalmatian, Dalmatian coast, modern day Croatia. It should be noted that monks were not meant to wander around at will. Gottschalk was not only doing that, but he was also preaching his own ideas based on his study of Augustine's texts about double predestination. This was a, a doctrine, a heretical doctrine at the time, that God predestined the elect to eternal life and the bad to eternal damnation. When in the late 840s, Rabanus, who was now Archbishop of Mainz, got wind of this, all hell broke loose, as it were. Gottschalk, confident that he could defend the ideas in his book, which was he called the, the book about predestination, Liber de Predestinatione, he, he was confident that he could represent himself at a synod of Mainz that was held in 848. So here's Mainz again. Present was King Louis the German, as well as abbots and bishops. The synod, and I'm going to put up some texts here um, and quote little bits from them to you as I, as I continue the story. The synod condemned Gottschalk for his wicked opinions and sent him to Bishop Hinkmar of Reims after making him take an oath that he would, quote, never return to the kingdom of Louis. So he's being banished from one kingdom. The following year at Chiazzi, which lay in the kingdom of Louis's brother Charles, another Episcopal Synod was convened by King Charles. Gottschalk was brought before it, and this is in your second excerpt there. Both of these are from contemporary Carolingian annals, which is a kind of a history writing. Gottschalk was brought before the second Synod, publicly flogged, I quote, and compelled to burn the books containing his teachings. He was also stripped of his priesthood and sentenced to silence and imprisonment in the monastery of Hautevillier, which is just south of Reims. Though in the popular imagination, medieval heretics were typically burned at the stake, this wasn't a punishment inflicted in early medieval Europe, nor does it seem that all of Gottschalk's writings and ideas have been lost. Some are preserved in the letters written by men like Hinkmar, who quoted Gottschalk in the process of condemning him. And this is not what I'm showing you here, but this is actually a letter from Rabanus to Hinkmar on the topic of Gottschalk. And as you can see from the title up here, his error, errorem up there. Gottschalk also never recanted. Two confessions survive in which he laid out his beliefs. So that's a confession of what he believed, not a confession of his crime. Um, and here's the opening to one of them, preserved again in a, in a contemporary manuscript. This is from the second half of the ninth century. So here's, here's his writing preserved for us. He also found support among some of the monks at Hautevillier and managed to smuggle out of his cell, becoming what scholar, modern scholar Matthew Gillis has called a master of subterranean descent. We would have lost the bulk of his work, however, if a trove of writings hadn't been discovered as recently as 1930 in a single 9th century manuscript that's now in a, a library in Bern. What Gottschalk was forced to burn at the Synod of Chiazzi was likely only a representative sample of his ideas and the patristic sources he thought supported them. Authorities attempted to silence and isolate him so that he couldn't be a bad influence on others, but ultimately without complete success. So turning to our second example, and that is going to be Abelard, um, born in around 1079. So we've skipped forward a couple of centuries. He was the eldest son of an aristocratic family, and he made as such the unusual decision to step away from a worldly life and pursue the life of the mind. The best way to do this at the time was to train as a cleric. In Abelard, as in Gottschalk, precocious and confident, even arrogant intellect, like Gottschalk, Abelard rebelled against his teachers, and these were, and I put up a little map here so you can see some of these places. They were William of Champeau, who taught in Paris, um, and Anselm of Léon, Léon, two of the foremost scholars of their time. Abelard bested them in the schoolroom and criticized their old fashioned ideas. For a while, Abelard opened his own schools, first at Melun, and that's on the map here, and Corbeil, and then even closer to Paris in, in Saint Victor. He might yet have enjoyed a distinguished career had he not fallen disastrously in love with a young lady called Eloise, and there she is back in this picture. 
this little miniature from a 14th century manuscript. But Eloise and Abelard are a topic for a different talk. Suffice it to say that after that affair went south, Abelard became a monk. The text that got him into trouble was his Theologia Summi Boni, the Theology of the Highest Good. Students of his former teacher, Anselm of Léon, picked it apart and charged him with heresy at a synod in Soissons, as you can see Soissons here, in 1121. Abelard was condemned as a heretic and made to burn his text. He was also sentenced to confinement in a monastery, but after a short time at saint Medard, he was allowed to return to his home monastery um, of Saint-Denis. On his return, however, he managed to rile up the monks by suggesting that their Saint Denis wasn't who they thought he was. He's a troublemaker. Um, he's too clever for his own good, really, Abelard. Abelard left Saint-Denis and, like Gottschalk, we see him moving between monasteries for many years. We also know that among many other texts produced, and these include an autobiography titled The Story of My Misfortunes, a celebrated letter exchange with Eloise that I'll be reading with students next semester, and cutting-edge theological texts like Te Schito, which means Know Thyself, Abelard was still working on his theologia. In 1140, Abelard's teaching Logic attracted the attention, not in a good way, of Bernard of Clairvaux, one of the most influential clerics of that time. Abelard challenged Bernard either to withdraw his accusations or declare them publicly at an upcoming church council in Sens, and that's down here. Bernard agreed to go public, but stacked the proceedings in his own favour. The night before the council was to take place, he persuaded the already assembled bishops to condemn a list of heretical propositions he attributed to Abelard. Abelard, on the day of the council, was then expected to explain himself. Unable to do so, Abelard left the council and appealed to Pope Innocent II. The Pope, however, quickly excommunicated Abelard and his followers, and Abelard was also sentenced to perpetual silence, confined to a monastery, and his books were to be burned. The story has a somewhat gentler ending, however. Peter the Venerable, Abbot of Cluny, which is all the way down here, took Abelard in on his way back to France, gave him refuge in Cluny, and arranged not only for him to be reconciled with Bernard, but for his excommunication to be lifted as well. Abelard, unlike Gottschalk, didn't longer long in monastic confinement, however. He died the following year. So the takeaways from these two stories offer, I think, key points about book banning and burning in the earlier medieval period. First of all, don't annoy your teachers. Both Gottschalk and Abelard showed arrogance, or courage, I suppose, in the way they took on the men who trained them. Both Gottschalk and Abelard had friends and supporters, but if the man accusing you of heresy is better connected or has higher status, then your case is unlikely to succeed. For, the, for an example of how to circulate very new ideas entirely successfully by cultivating the right patrons with due humility while also being a woman, check out the career of Abelard's contemporary, the visionary Hildegard of Bingen. That's for another talk. Two, again, don't annoy your teachers. I can't help wondering whether Gottschalk and Abelard would have enjoyed greater success for themselves and their ideas if they had worked cooperatively with others or collaboratively. There was room for debate in the medieval classroom. Theologians, abbots and bishops might be persuaded by new and different interpretations, but not if they were browbeaten and insulted, which tended to be Gottschalk and Abelard's MO. And third, book burning was a public display intended to shame and humiliate the one convicted of heresy. It was all the more humiliating if you were made to torch the books yourself, which, which happened. The heretic, though he might have been flogged, wasn't himself put to the fire, however. Further, in neither Gottschalk nor Abelard's case does there seem to have been any effort to round up and destroy every copy of whatever offensive thing they'd published. In Gottschalk's case, his writings, his theoretical ideas, continued even under a sentence of perpetual silence. He was smuggling out those pamphlets. And it's a bit like Lauren said about once you've heard something, that idea doesn't die. Abelard continued to teach after his first trial as well. Indeed, manuscripts of his Theologia Summi Boni, and here is the opening of one of them, survived to the present day. The text has also now been digitized and you can read it online. It's tempting to interp interpret Gottschalk and Abelard's stories as involving clashes of personality with leading figures of their time, but public condemnation by a few didn't end support for these scholars and their works. Modern scholarly opinion now views them both as innovative thinkers way ahead of their time. Thank you. Professor Woods, uh, thank you so much. Um,
I, I wanted to ask a question. We, we heard from our first speaker talking about during Roman times that there was treason. And as you outlined in our medieval times, it was heresy. Um, was there treason um, issues that we, that we had evidence of in the historical record in that medieval times? And do you have an understanding of how that transition occurred um, from, from treason being a primary issue to more heresy? I'm sure there are examples. I tend to work more on the um, the religious uh, historical side of things, but I will say, and I think this at least partially answers your question, the folks that were, um, especially for the ninth century and the 12th, and this is where we get the word clerk from, clerk, from cleric, the educated folks, the ones who were writing, producing texts were, um, were religious. They were in, in the first example, um, monks, monks and perhaps canons, people associated with cathedrals. And then later, as you move through towards the birth of universities in 1200, these guys are ordained, they're clerics. Um, so they're studying theology. That's, that's one of the main topics in the first university that we have uh, in Paris. Um, so I think if we're thinking about written text, if we're thinking about banning books, I think we're often looking at um at the, the folks who are actually producing most of the texts at that point i'm sure there were um people condemned for treason um possibly for breaking different kinds of laws than writing books um, if that if that kind of approaches your approaches an answer to your question it, it, it does. Um, and thank you. Um, I do want to let the audience know that we will continue to have some more questions that we can um, ask both Professor Woods and Professor Eisner, but I uh, wanted to transition to Martin Eisner, um, Professor of Romance Studies. Um, and once again, we'll follow up with some questions um, to him and also our other speaker. So um, Professor Eisner, take it away. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for um for the invitation to talk to you today. And it's uh, really um, exciting to kind of follow this and see the historical trajectory um, that, that's already being uh, traced through these through, through these three talks. Now, I, I have to admit, I had, I had some real trouble um, figuring out which example to share with you today, um, since my research um, deals with uh, several authors whose works um, have been censored and banned for, for centuries and for, for various reasons at different points in time. Um, but I thought I'd focus uh, just on two of them um, today. Uh, one is, is Dante, um, and just to give you the dates, he's uh, born in 1265 and dies in 1321. And then from the generation following him, uh, Boccaccio, who uh, is born in 1313 and dies in 1375. Um, and uh, there are a whole series of examples, and I'll give you just a few to, to start us um, thinking. Um, these, this is a 16th century edition of Dante's Vita Nuova, um, where the editors have intervened to, um, to revise Dante's description of Beatrice, this beloved um, girl that he writes the Vita Nuova about and then ultimately will write the Commedia about. Um, and Dante describes her in all of the manuscripts as gloriosa, as glorious. Uh, but the uh, 16th century um, editors find this claim to be a little too theologically daring. And so she goes from being uh, la gloriosa donna to being la graziosa donna. So she goes from being glorious, which suggests some kind of divine element, to being gracious. So her, her, her kind of divine potentiality um, gets gets reduced, and that daring theological um, conjunction that Dante invents um, is is largely erased. Um, and, and another another example um, from from Boccaccio uh, is, and and you all may be familiar with the Decameron now that we've we've spent time in a pandemic. The this collection of a hundred um, stories recounted during the the thirteen forty eight plague in Florence, and that too. Um, is attacked um, by editors in 16th century. And, and I do mean attacked. Um, the editor, Leonardo Salviati of this edition um, is referred to uh, in contemporary documents as the assassin um, for all of the holes that he puts into the Decameron text. And you can see um, on the, 
the uh, screen here, I've, I've circled a few of them, but there are more of them, these little asterisks that uh, Salviati inserts into the text where he's taken something out. Um, and there's a note here in the margins that says, si lasciano questi. So, so I've left these fragments here, or these fragments have been left here um, to preserve more words and more uh, modes of speech, uh, as many as one can. So there's, a, there's an interesting tension that comes with the censor in, in the 16th century, where on the one hand, he wants to, Salviati wants to preserve uh, Boccaccio's language because Boccaccio is the model for, um, for Italian prose. Uh, on, so on the one hand, he wants to kind of save as many modes of speech as possible. And on the other, he wants to get rid of any modes of speech, any um, metaphors that might seem um, licentious or problematic. So there's there are these interesting tensions, really almost like a psychological tension that gets worked out um, on the page as Salviati tries to uh, purify Boccaccio's text um, for, for his audience. Now, this kind of censorship, this kind of transformation of Boccaccio goes on for a very, <clears throat> very long time. Uh, here is a, another uh, wonderful example. This is a 19, 1930 uh, modern library edition, and I've highlighted, you can see there, it's, it's said to be complete and unabridged. Um, but you, if you look at the page there um, uh, that I've uh, uh, scanned for you, you'll see that it goes from, from uh, an English language uh, text, so therefore a translation, to a long, long passage in Italian. Uh, and the translators have added a little note, a little footnote that says the translators regret that the disuse into which magic has fallen makes it impossible to render the technicalities of that mysterious art into tolerable English. So, so they they want it to be complete and unabridged, um, but they they find this limit in in this particular story of Alibek and Rustico, and so the text that had been a translation uh, is is now um, just the original Italian um, for for those who might be capable uh, of reading it. And and I should say this particular passage um, from from the story of the third day actually won't appear in English in an uncensored form uh, until until 1972. Uh, so so this uh, history of censorship goes on for a long time. So what makes these examples so interesting um, to me is that this censorship and uh, transformation happens centuries after the work's composition. So it suggests something about how these pre-modern works remain revolutionary even as they cross borders of language, cultures, and periods. I, and that's not to say that these works weren't also regarded as revolutionary and problematic in their historical moment. So just to give two examples of about the two texts I just mentioned, uh, Cecco d'Ascoli uh, famously in this text called La Cerba, the bitter, uh, the bitter one, bitter age, uh, he writes uh, against Dante's um, depiction of Beatrice, saying it's uh, it's insane and crazy to to invest this this mortal girl with such um, divine attributes. Um, and similarly, uh, on the the other image here is of, of Petrarch, who translates Boccaccio Boccaccio into Latin. Uh, he translates the final story of the Decameron into Latin, and in doing so, he transforms what for Boccaccio is a story. Um, that is meant to urge and encourage civic disobedience. He turns it into a story that is about obedience to God. Um, so there are different ways in which um, the, these early readers uh, respond to uh, these the, the daring elements of, of both Dante and, and Boccaccio. So, so while these examples show the, the revolutionary features of, of the works, um, th they are probably better characterized as uh, censored moments rather than banned moments uh, in the proper sense, since a banning would seem to necessarily involve some kind of political or, or social institution that is, um, that is establishing the ban. So I, I want to um, end this, this brief um, discussion with a really excellent example of a proper ban um, that comes from 
another of Dante's works uh, called Monarchia. Um, and this text argues against the legitimacy of the papacy's claim to, um, to temporal authority, uh, which was putatively uh, invested in the church at um, through, through what's known as the donation of Constantine. Um, there are a series of different versions of the story. Um, this one is beautifully represented in uh, Santi Quattro Coronati in Rome. Um, the story is that uh, Constantine um, has leprosy, uh, he falls sick. Um, he calls on Pope Sylvester who heals him. And uh, as a sort of gift for this uh, new life, uh, Constantine gifts gifts uh, gives to the um, gives to the church the the Western Empire. Um, now Lorenzo Valla, that's the third little image there. Lorenzo Valla will prove that this document, this donation of Constantine, uh, that the document itself is is a forgery. But um, before he does that, so this is in 1440. Um, Dante will write the Monarchia in, in 1320, 1318, 1317, maybe. Um, he, Dante, will argue against the donation of Constantine purely on, on legal and logical grounds, that the em emperor and the empire uh, is under an obligation not to limit the extent of its empire, and the church could not uh, accept this gift because the church should not be involved in temporal affairs. Um, and finally, this is the, the third point um, that appears, for example, in Boccaccio's summary, that, that the authority of the empire proceeds directly from God and not through the mediation of any vicar of his, as it seems the clergy would have it. In other words, the empire has its own authority that and is not dependent on the papacy. Now, these arguments that Dante develops in the Monarchia also appear in, in the Divine Comedy, that the empire takes care of the body in this world while the church attends to the soul in the afterlife. Um, so it's this argument against the papacy and for the empire that makes the work uh, so important after Dante's death. So he writes this um, after he's written Paradiso, he refers to Paradiso as already written uh, when he composes the Monarchia. He, um, he, he dies in 1321 without um, particular uh, problems. I mean, he does die in exile from, from his uh, patria, from, from Florence. Uh, so, so he does have some political um, problems, but the monarchia itself doesn't become controversial until after his death, when a series of propagandists and publicists for uh, the empire, uh, people like Marsilio Padua, adopt Dante's arguments to refute papal claims to secular power, to, to power in the world. Um, and it's at this point, uh, about a decade after Dante's death, that according to Boccaccio, the book, which was scarcely known before, became very famous. So famous, in fact, that Messer Bertrand, Cardinal Puget, and papal legate of Pope John XXII, seized the book and condemned it in public to the flames as containing heretical matter. He also tried to burn the bones of the author to the eternal infamy and shame of his own memory. Uh, he would have succeeded had he not been opposed by a noble and worthy Florentine knight. So we don't have to take um, Dante uh, Boccaccio's word for it here, um, since Dante's Monarchia was um, not only the object of um, this is burning, um, but also a sustained attack um, by a Dominican preacher named uh, Guido Bernani, who wrote a text that was called a refutation of the Monarchia, which he wrote apparently at the behest of uh, Pope John the uh, Twenty Second. And this figure, Pope John the Twenty Second, I'll just say two more words about um, because he appears uh, in this extraordinary monument by uh, Emilio Iscro, which is from. Um, it's in Milan and it is just been put, it was unveiled in 2018. And you'll see um, the, the way that Iskra brilliantly calls attention to, um, to the act of censorship itself, right? You have, you have the, these uh, 
this uh, page on the left is the beginning of the Divine Comedy, Nel Mezzo del Camino di Nostra Vita, in the middle of the path of our life. And um, so that's Inferno 1. And on the other page there, you'll see um, Tu che sol per cancellare scrivi. So you who write only to erase, which most critics have taken as um, a direct attack on the Pope, on Pope John the uh, 22nd, for loving to, to excommunicate people. Um, but there's a particular beauty, of course, in, in this line, tu che so per cancellare scrivi, you who write only to erase, since Iscaro's strategy here and in some other works is precisely to erase uh, large swaths of Dante's text in order to bring into focus, right, these particular um, details of it. So, um, so it sort of describes Iscaro's uh, own, own artistic strategy. So, like so this is John the 22nd. He's the one who's behind Vernani's um, refutation of the monarchia. Um, the, the refutation, I, I won't go into, but the interdiction against the book, uh, it's, it's banning and so on, leads to its presence on the index of prohibited books uh, once we reach the age of print through um, 1881, it will be on the index of prohibited books. And this leads to some, some interesting manuscripts that I just want to share with you before I, before I stop. Um, the, the, this attempt to conceal the text. So uh, here's a copy of the Monarchia. It's from 1350, so it's after the controversy. And you can see at the top of the page there, there's an incipit that says, Incipit Rhetorica Dantes. Here begins Dante's rhetoric. Dante never wrote a book called Rhetoric. Um, but this becomes the, the, the cover for it. This is the text that follows is the Monarchia itself. And the scribe has a little fun at the very end of the manuscript. Um, he says, you know, here it ends. Guess if you want to know. In divino lo se sapere. And then another uh, Trecento hands writes Monarchia Dante. So the, so the, um, the riddle has been solved by this by this later reader. Um, now, uh, the um, the banning of the monarchia is one part of it. This that like like I said happens in the 1320s, and I will I'll stop in one second here. I'll just show you one last one two last images. Um, in 1335, the Divine Comedy itself will get will get banned as well, um, and. The vernacular compositions of Dante will be will be forbidden reading for the Dominicans. That's in 1335. This is Santa Maria Novella, the Dominican seat in, in Florence. And in 1350, they have a fresco of Dante's Divine Comedy represented in the Strozzi uh, Chapel. So uh, another example of what um, we've already heard about, that banning the books seems to make people um, find them all more attractive, even to, to paint them in the very precincts from which they were supposed to be excluded. Thank you, uh, Professor Eisner. Um, we are at uh, eight o'clock, a little bit past eight o'clock. Um, we will go till uh, about 8.15 or so to kind of allow for some more questions um, from the audience here. Um, I wanted to start off with the following question. Um, and th this one is uh, particular to Professor Eisner. Um, one of our attendees asked, it seems the banning of books or censoring of books in the late Middle Ages was a delayed reaction to the original publications. Can you comment on the reasons for this delay or is it just an observational bias? Um, it seems like they were delayed. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know, nine, nine years doesn't seem, I, I wish people would ban my books nine years after it was published, I'm ready. Um, it, feels, it feels like within the lifetime of it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, clearly in, in the preprint world, it's a, it's a little bit more complicated, like how this kind of banning works. Um, and Claire was talking about, you know, ideas too, right? How do you ban ideas? How do you, how do you adjudicate those sorts of things? So um, there you can have nice councils and you can make proclamations. Uh, and with, you know, with literary text is a little bit different because how dangerous are literary texts? And that sort of came up in our first one, right? Is Catullus making fun of, baldness um, really all that dangerous or not. Is there a difference between Roman times and medieval times and then into the Roman Empire in the extent of control that the book banner had over the, the actual distribution of books? 
or was that yeah. independent of, of 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 the actual banner yeah i think um it's very similar because uh it's like um lauren was talking about um these are all well these are all hand copied uh, there is no printing press. So um, the later you get, so when you move into the sort of 12th and 13th centuries, you have different methods of book production that mean you can produce books, especially books that are in high demand, like university books, um, much more quickly. There's a different copying system. But before that, um, you expend time and resources copying manuscripts. Um, so you're careful about what you copy. It costs money. Um, and also you don't have any centralized, and I think this gets to the question, you don't have any centralized place kind of distributing things. Um, and my research is looking at how texts circulated in the ninth centuries, texts by ninth century authors. So I'm, I'm, that's actually my big research project at the moment. And it's very much kind of, it almost seems a little bit haphazard who might have heard about a text and asked to make a copy of it. Um, but no, there's no, it's very similar to the Roman world. Um, although there were there were public libraries in the Roman world and in the medieval period that I've been talking about, um, libraries tend to be belong to institutions, um, religious institutions and monasteries. You might have a, a prince. You do have um, aristocrats and princes that build their own libraries and have people copy books for them. Um, but there is no kind of centralized distribution. Um, it makes it very hard to kind of get get a hold of every copy of something, because I think, as Lauren said, who knows who's who sneaked a copy and, and hidden it away. And it makes me think of, um, there's a scene in um, uh, The Name of the Rose, where there's that hidden secret little library um, of Umberto Eco's book. And you've got like the, the stuff that's hidden away. And some things from the classical world survived, perhaps because they were tucked away. Some of the Ovid's poetry and Catullus, some of the poets who are very edgy and, and get the treatment that we see in um, Martin's uh, talk there where translations don't translate the Latin and if it's really, really risque, they put it into Greek, right? Um, that's that's happening. Um, but those texts survived. They were in a copy somewhere. Um, so so you can't actually kind of wipe everything out. It's tucked away in a little library somewhere, if that answers that question. Professor Eisner, any any thoughts on that question from, from your perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think you create these um, temporary authorities. So, you know, the the University of Paris condemns, uh, you know, 271 beliefs or, or what have you. Um, but that's great. I mean, that's a problem if you're in Paris. Um, but, you know, I'm okay, I'm okay if we're in Rome, that's fine. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, of regional um, variety. Uh, so you can go you know, you, your political beliefs, your religious beliefs. I mean, there's a lot of space for for moving around, and and things things do survive. I mean, it's always that question of of um, what were Claire's monks doing, copying some of this stuff. You know, I mean, for me, that's always one of those questions because then you know, Petrarch will will discover them, and he'll think he's found these like classical manuscripts. But what he's found is stuff that that these scribes from the eighth and seventh century have, have transcribed. Um, so there's this, um, yeah, um, th there's just so much variety around, <laughs> around all of these things, uh, which is why I guess Claire and I have, have wasted hours of our lives looking at these manuscripts to try to figure out what the stories they tell, because they're, they're so fascinating and individual um, in, in what they have. Yeah, and that whole idea of censorship is actually later medieval. Um, so one of the things that I didn't bring it out as a point, but it occurred to me as I was writing my talk or thinking about the talk, was that what you need is a patron for the earlier medieval period. You need good patrons. And what you do to make sure your book is accepted is that you send it to somebody who can say, oh, this is great. Yeah. And I, I endorse it. Um, and then it and then it spreads. And that's the problem, I think, that um, my guys uh, hit up against is that they they pissed off the people that could have helped them most. <laughs> Just crazy, really, but yeah. Another question is, why do you think people attempt to ban books today, even when books are even more attainable than in the past? So we're, we're bringing some of the lessons that we've learned that you've told us about Roman times and, and into the medieval times. Um, I know it's more of a commentary of our current political uh, state in, in terms of banning books, but any any thoughts on that? I, I think it's kind of funny. I mean, I, if I 
well, I, I'm curious to hear what Claire's response is, but um, it, it's 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 odd um, because we've moved from a, a a world where like information was the thing. So if you suppressed a book, you might actually prevent. I mean, we we've said that like ultimately, sort of like the, the book will win the day and the idea will circulate. But the idea was that you you know you you close off that that information stream, and now. Um, we seem to have moved into the, the age of disinformation, right? Where we we we, we spread fake knowledge, um, and so it's interesting. The idea of banning books actually seems totally out of keeping with the new strategies of of controlling knowledge. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, it's but, kind of public. It's the kind yeah. of public statement they're making at a synod by burning one copy of a book. I mean, you can't stop it. But it's like this is my public statement about what I think, and it's political, and it's you know, it makes a splash and it's completely ultimately ineffectual, especially with the way we spread information and text now. I mean, the, it's all digital, it's all there. You can't wipe it off the web. Um, so, okay, some of the, if it's just been published and it's and it's in copyright and, you know, it, it might not be available electronically, um, but I, I think it's just, it's a futile gesture, but it's one that's just, um, it's, it's just making a statement really. Um, and the book will the book will stay. The book will live on. Can you tell us um, what the influence of literacy was in those times? I'm assuming the literacy rates were significantly lower. Um, and and with that, how did that affect the the banning of these books? And what role did that that did that play? And then was there aspects of more oral? or oratory passing on of some of these books? It's an interesting question. It's hard to get at. Um, I've, already, I've already mentioned the fact that um, clerics, uh, monks, priests, nuns, um, tend to be the ones that are educated and literate. Um, but literacy didn't always mean that you could read and write. You could read, you might not be able to write. That's also an interesting kind of thing that is very hard for us to wrap our heads around now, but probably and you'd also have um, kind of aristocratic families teaching their kids how to read and write. And that would be um, Abelard's path. I mean, he was the eldest son, but his father educated all his children and that gave Abelard a choice. Um, so there is, and we've also got information jumping back centuries to the eighth and ninth of libraries that were owned by aristocratic families. So they, their, their people could read and write, possibly write, they could certainly read. Um, so. You know, I think um, it, it might have something to do with your status, um, whether you had access to some form of education. Um, the lower classes might not might not have had that to any great degree. Um, but, you know, the people the, the chattering classes, if you like, the ones that could talk about ideas um, were probably able to uh, to read things, to hear things and understand them, pass them on. Um, what you've also got to remember, I think, is that for the um, the period that I'm talking about, the lingua franca is Latin. So that is able, you're able to spread stuff everywhere because it's in Latin, even though regional vernaculars are de developing, even as early as eighth, ninth centuries, um, things are being written down in Latin. So that helps spread stuff further than you might imagine uh, because it's the same language um, that's, that's holding the thoughts. So over to you, Martin. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, um... You know, my world is totally different. <laughs> we have the emergence. <laughs> we have the emergence of the vernacular, which is intended to access um, classes, especially women. For Dante, the vernacular is to is to address women. Um, now, certainly, there are literate women. Eloise is a great example too. Um, uh, but also in Dante's age, the Ache, well, there are these these noble families that have um, that have fully um, literate. Uh, um, women, women members, uh, but the emergence of the vernacular means you have a completely new um, audience for these texts, and this audience participates not only through um, through listening and consuming, but consuming and preserving. So they're also writing these texts down. Um, so, so many of the early copies of the Decameron, for example, are written in a in this sort of hurried hand called Mercantesca because they're all merchants. So they're used to like writing quick accounts, but they're also writing the Decameron at the same time. Um, so 
Yeah, so the vernacular clearly opens up um, a sort of uh, horizontal, new horizontal space um, or spaces. And then also means that you have a lack of that lingua franca of like the kind of pan-European. Um, although I'm sure Claire would tell us she, she can read Italian easily no matter what anyway. So yeah, you know, if you know your Latin. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna take one more last question here. And it seems like some books were possibly eradicated out of existence, but we know they existed because other people referenced them. Are there any major works that have been lost that seem more profound or important from the historical record that you would want to most read? <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I can take this one. I have you one. Um, one yeah. So Petrarch wrote a play called Philologia. So it was called Philology. Uh, we have one line from it. I'd love to know what the rest of it has. <laughs> yeah, and I can think of lots of things that weren't necessarily banned, but we so much from the ancient world just did not make it. And that's not because it was banned. It's because it, it was maybe in one manuscript copy that got damaged or destroyed. So I can think of lots of things, but I don't think they fit the previously banned category. So I, I won't offer any of those. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for this presentation. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you. Um, for our audience for joining us today.